First, I would like to welcome and thank everyone for participating this evening in the Shloshim for Rabbi Lerafield Zatzal. We are going to begin first with a video presentation by the oldest grandson of Rabbi Lerafield, Rabbi Menachem Lerafield, who sent in and prepared a video presentation. And so we will begin with that. Towards the end of his life, Yaakov Avinu gathers together his children to give them a final blessing. But before blessing his children, he gives a bracha to Menashe and Ephraim. Why would Yaakov prioritize his grandchildren over his children? Many creatures have a parent-child relationship. It's natural. Whether a mother lion caring for her cubs or a mother bird feeding her babies. But a grandchild, grandparent relationship, that is something that is uniquely human. Only human beings have the concept of perpetuation beyond a single generation. That is something that is so important to the Jewish people. But even more profound than a relationship between grandparent and grandchild is growing up with grandparents. Before the Jewish people are redeemed from Egyptian slavery, the Torah begins to give the lineage of Moshe Rabbeinu. And before it does so, it lists Reuven and his children. It lists Shimon and his children. But with Levi, it does something different. Number one, it lists Levi's age. And secondly, it begins to list all of Levi's grandchildren. The Sforno explains that Levi's grandchildren were unique. That's something my grandfather would always say. Were unique. They were unique because they had a special relationship with their grandfather Levi. Because Levi lived to such an old age, he lived so long, he was able to raise not only his children, but his grandchildren as well. I am so grateful to my parents for everything they do for me. My parents, for those who know, are the most generous and giving people I know. But the greatest thing my parents have given me and my siblings is the relationship with our grandparents. I was so fortunate to grow up around the corner from my grandparents. They were a part of my everyday life. I spent every single Shabbos and Yantif of my childhood with my grandparents. I would go over there after school just to play. I would sleep over just because. I cannot tell you how life-changing it is to have a second pair of parents, a second set of parents, right around the corner. They were part of every single school celebration, no matter how small. No matter what it was, they were there. I would learn often with my grandfather. And I remember after we finished our very first Masechta together, it was Masechta's Makos, he took me out to a restaurant, which doesn't seem like a very big thing, but if you knew my grandfather, you knew and you know that he loathes the experience of going to a restaurant. He was, he was philosophically opposed to the idea and the concept of eating out. And Yet, we finished the Masechta, and he said, we're going to the restaurant. I remember it as if it was yesterday, Pinati, on Miami Gardens Drive. I remember where we sat. And it was such an interesting experience, because here was someone who hated eating out, was philosophically opposed to eating in a restaurant, and yet, this time was different. It was Kavata Torah. This time it was celebrating a Torah achievement, and for that, it was not only worth it, but it was... It was a mitzvah. It was a sutas mitzvah. He taught me my bar mitzvah parsha, and it wasn't your typical bar mitzvah tutor child experience where, you know, I know a lot of my friends. They would go to the tutor. They would get recordings. They would listen to it. They would memorize it. He insisted on teaching me how to lane, and then once I learned how to lane, and I started learning the Parsha, I had to memorize it because we weren't going to meet 
at home or in his house or office, we did the entire preparation for Ivar Mitzvah, the Parsha, the Haftorah, the learning how to daven Musa from, for the Amud, practicing the many, 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 many speeches. All of that we did on our bikes and we would ride up and down the canal and that was before there was that median there. So we would be running into other pedestrians and cyclists, cars, ducks, you name it. Because we had to go side by side. We actually ran into each other a few times. And that's how I learned my bar mitzvah. That's how I got prepared for that bar mitzvah. And it didn't end there. I think most kids, when they're done with their bar mitzvah, that's like the last time they have to get up and speak until, you know, maybe some family simcha 20 years later. But that was not how this was gonna work. So right after my bar mitzvah, I think it was the week after, my grandfather said to me, okay, you're gonna be speaking in shul, and he gave me, I think my bar mitzvah parsha was toldos, and he said, you know, parshas, I think it was shemos, ve'era, bo, one of those, you're gonna be speaking in shul. And was not the last time, I would say three to four times a year from the time I was bar mitzvah until I graduated high school, my grandfather had me speaking from the pulpit in Shul. And along with speaking meant hours and hours and hours of preparation. I would have to go several times a week to his house and we would sit there and go over speech ideas and I would have to say the speech over and he would critique it and give me feedback. And I remember growing up, I hated that. I said, I don't mind speaking. I just don't want to sit there going over and over and over. And looking back, I think that was the whole point. The whole reason why he had me speak from the Ahmed, he had me speak from the pulpit, was specifically to be able to spend that time with me to go over those speeches. And when the speech was over, then I had to walk home from Shul to his house, because we always had Shabbos lunch at his house. And he would grab me by the arm and he'd walk home with me and giving me a blow by blow, minute by minute feedback on every single part of the speech and what he liked. And he liked this pause there and this pause there. And you could have gone a little slower over here. You could have, you skipped a part, you missed this, you, and I, again, I hated that. But looking back, I have no doubt that that was the whole point. He created opportunities for connection. He created opportunities for us to spend time together. He used to call me almost every night of the week because something in the house wasn't working, whether it was the phone or the fax machine or later on the computer or the TV, whatever it was, he would call me and you know this, this thing's not working, that thing's not working and I would come, I'd fix it in a minute or two, but not before my grandmother fed me and my grandfather shared a joke or a mice or something. And all of those things were orchestrated, I think, just to have the opportunity to spend time together. And it didn't end when I left home. I, especially when I went into the family business and I became a rabbi, I would call my Zaidi every week and he would ask how I was and how my children and my wife were. And after the minute or two of pleasantries, he would say to me, so how many drushes do you have this week? And I would rattle off a list as if I was standing at a deli counter ordering lunch. And I would say, I have a wedding and a baby naming and four classes. And he would just right there and then just list off speech options. And he would give me three options for each speech or class I needed to prepare and right off, as he would say, off the top of his yarmulke, and effortlessly. And then I was prepared for the week, and that was it. I would call him for advice. I would call him for anything that I needed. Before Pesach last year, I was going to be giving a lot of classes. So I naturally called up my Zadie, my speechwriter, and said, I have a dozen or so classes I need to prepare. Can we go over it? And we began, and it was gonna be a several hour process. So we met once for two hours, and obviously we barely scratched the surface. Then we met a second time for another hour or so. And 
We had made plans to meet the next morning. And I called him for our meeting the next morning to go over our Pesach classes and speeches. And he tells me that he's not able to meet because he's going to be going to the doctor. He had fallen and was having some breathing issues. I think they thought that maybe something had gotten punctured during his fall. And we never finished that conversation. That was really, that was the day he went into the hospital and he ended up staying there for several months. Um, we didn't know at the time, but he had COVID and that was the last time we really had those types of conversations. This has been a really hard year for me. You know, my grandfather was my go-to for everything, for advice, for material for a class or a good joke. My Zadie taught me everything. He taught me to love learning. He taught me how to drive or at least try to. He taught me how to speak publicly. He taught me everything, but most importantly, he taught me how to live. My Zadie was world renowned for his teaching and scholarship and for good reason. His breadth of knowledge was truly awe-inspiring. He knew Tanakh by heart and would quote Sukkim often, no matter whether it was his answering machine or he was talking to someone on the street. And of course, when he was preparing and delivering his classes, he knew everything. He was a world expert in the laws of Jewish divorce. I don't know that anybody in the world knew Hilchus Gittin better than him. And I don't think anybody in the world had arranged more Jewish divorces than him. He just knew everything, but none of those things stand out to me as the most impressive or the most important ways that I remember my Zadie. I don't remember those parts. What I remember are the life lessons he taught me. I remember the way he lived his life, the way he treated and talked to people. I accompanied my grandfather to get an often. You know, when I was older and after completing a course in Safras, he taught me how to write Gittin and I wrote a few for him. I would be there as an aide, as a witness, or there just tagging along as a young child. And I remember just the way he spoke to these people who were clearly going through a very difficult and emotional time. And he spoke to them with such care and consideration and chachma. I, it was amazing. It was amazing to see the way he spoke to them. And that is something that I will remember so much more than just the breadth of knowledge that he had, the way he would explain how every little nuance of everything he was doing was because of this opinion of this Akron and this Akron and this Chumra and just what stuck out the most. And what I remember today was the way he spoke to the people. I don't remember necessarily what we learned together. But I do remember that when we learned and he got a phone call, the way he spoke to the person on the other end. And some of those people were going through the most horrific challenges that were unimaginable. And he always knew exactly what to say. He always knew how to ensure that the person left feeling better at the end. He had the most magnificent sense of humor. He always had an insightful joke, a joke that would just allow everyone to be comfortable. It would put everyone at ease. <laughs> Towards the end, I was visiting maybe a year ago, maybe less, a few months ago with my sister Leia. And we were sitting there and I don't remember how it came up, but we mentioned one of his old jokes. Uh, you know, he said, what's the difference between in-laws and outlaws? And I couldn't remember the punchline. So I asked Leia, my sister, you know, what, what is the punchline? And my grandfather motions and he lips. And again, it took, at that point, it was so difficult for him to speak. And yet he, like as sharp as ever, looked at my sister Leia and said, outlaws are wanted. And that was the punch. He always used humor. And that's again, something I'll remember forever. If for whatever reason he couldn't ride his bike to Shul and he was riding his bike till almost the end, I don't remember my grandfather ever taking a car unless it was on the highway. 
But if for whatever reason he went to Shul and he couldn't um, come home on his bike because it was raining or he had to go somewhere else that was further away and I would become the chauffeur, I remember so distinctly how we never left on time because there was always a line of people that were waiting to meet him. There were, and, and he went through with each person and gave them the time of day and had patience and just, again, knew exactly what to say. He was so gentle and kind always. When one of us scraped our knee, he was the one we went to. Anything involving blood actually was his department. I remember when my sister Nachama, we were playing in a box. I think that was actually my grandfather's idea. He was always into games that were not always so safe. So we had a big box from some sort of appliance and we were playing inside of it. And then eventually the box tipped over and my sister went into the corner of a coffee table and as my grandfather described it, brains were flying out everywhere. And he was the one who kind of held her head together until it was properly stitched up. And that was always his job. He was always there, you know, just taking care of us and being that presence, always with kindness and compassion and caring. And it's so funny because everyone knows my grandfather as this scholar and teacher, but to us, it was the chesed. It was the kindness. I remember being in his house once. I think they were building the swing set outside. And I don't know where my grandmother was, but she wasn't there. And you'll see why exactly in a second, because if she was there, she would have fed them before they walked in the door. But for whatever reason, my grandmother wasn't there. But before this man was able to go outside and build a swing set, he had to first sit down to the table and my grandfather went into the refrigerator and he took a salami and he, I didn't know that he knew where the refrigerator was, but he took out a salami and he took out a knife. It probably wasn't a Fleischik knife because I don't think he knew which side of the kitchen was Milchik's and which side of the kitchen was Fleischik's, but he took out a knife and he started slicing a salami and he took out bread and he spread them. He made this guy, this worker who obviously wasn't expecting this, but the way he cared for this person, if you are somebody who's working in my house, you're doing something for me, I have to take care of you first. And he fed him and took care of him and made him this pastrami sandwich I'll never forget, or salami sandwich. He cared for people so deeply. We were once going to the airport and I was taking my uncle Benjamin and his family, but we didn't fit in one car. So someone took one car and he was with me in the other car taking some of the children and the luggage. And I remember he was so insistent and drove me crazy to make sure that the two cars got to the airport at exactly the same time. And I couldn't figure out why it was so important to him. He's like, you're going to, he made me pull over on the side of the highway, on the side of I-95 to wait until we saw the other car so we could make sure that we were there together so we got to the airport at the same time. And I couldn't figure out why. And as we were pulling up to the airport, he explained the reason why was that he had the money for the tip and he wanted to make sure that the person at the airport, the baggage handler, would get the tip before he started handling the bags so that he would know that the tip was coming. <laughs> like, who thinks of that? But my grandfather did. I remember maybe, uh, probably two years ago, I was in Miami for something, I don't remember what and my grandfather had to go to the hospital. Some sort of numbers were elevated or something and for whatever reason, I went with him to the hospital. It was on a Friday right before Shabbos. And we go to the hospital, we get checked in. I think we thought we were gonna be there for Shabbos. And they're, you know, plugging things in and, and checking vitals. And turns out everything was fine and I don't remember what, it was a heart rate or something was elevated for some side reason. I think some medication, it doesn't matter. But we were sitting there in the hospital and the entire time we were there, he was counseling the male nurse who was working on him. So if you knew my grandfather, you knew when he was in a situation like that, he was very nervous. He was agitated. You could tell that he was overly concerned about what was going on and if he would be okay and you couldn't see any, I knew that that was going on in his head, but you wouldn't be able to tell because the entire time, 
all he was doing was caring about the nurse and what was happening with his marriage and you know how he can work on things and take care of stuff and it was fascinating to watch him he was rabinating from the hospital bed and the same was true in the past year whenever we would go to visit we'd walk in the room and he would give the biggest smile and he would be so excited to see you no matter who you were you could have been you know the hired help or a child or a grandchild and everybody got that beaming beaming smile and i know that that was difficult it wasn't easy for him to get up and to smile at that moment but he did it because he knew it would make us feel good and that's all it was so yes i learned a ton with my grandfather but it wasn't about what we learned it was about the way he lived his life it was about teaching us how to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. But, and I'll close with this, I know my grandfather right now would be telling me I'm going over time. When we were young, growing up, we would play with my grandfather. And he was the kind of grandfather that wasn't the sitting in the chair and telling kids to be quiet kind of grandfather. He was the kind that would get down on the floor and play with us. And we would play all kinds of wild games, but most notably was what he called the fight to the finish. We would wrestle. And whenever we had a fight to the finish, it always had to be on the floor. And he had a principle, a concept he lived by. And he said, the reason why we always do fight to the finish on the floor is you cannot fall off the floor. Now, what that meant was not be careful. It was exactly the opposite. It was be as reckless as you want, be as rowdy as you want, because you're in a safe place, you're on the floor. And as long as you're on the floor, as long as you're in a place that's safe, you can be a little bit more wild. You can let loose, you can be rowdy. I realized listening to the different hespatum at the funeral that that wasn't just something, a motto that we use when we were playing on the floor. It wasn't just something we used when we were wrestling, but that was really my grandfather's mantra for life you can't fall off the floor. What I realized that that means is that my grandfather believed that he was on the floor. He was in a safe place. Hashem was with him. And if Hashem is on your side, you can do anything. There's nothing you can't do as long as you're on the floor. As long as you're in a place that's safe, as long as you are in the protection of Hashem, you can accomplish anything and that was how my grandfather lived his life. It didn't matter what anybody else said. It didn't matter what kind of pressure or threats he got from somebody else. Above all, my grandfather was a yashar. He was as straight as an arrow. He did the right thing always. And he always knew what that right thing was. That's not always so easy. He knew what the right thing was, and he did it regardless of what anyone else thought or said. And he said that countless times, and I heard him say that countless times. I'm doing it l'shem shemayim. Who cares what they say? Who cares what they think? I remember people used to call him in the middle of the night with death threats because they gave you know, this person's wife a, a get, and the disgruntled husband was angry about it. He didn't care. If I'm on the floor, I cannot fall. If I'm in Hashem's embrace, I cannot fall. There's such a huge void that is now left behind. I don't have that person to call for advice. I don't have that person to help me with my classes and my speeches. But most of all, I don't have that person to teach me how to live. But hopefully, Hopefully I can remember the lessons that he taught me and I can share them with my children and they can share them with their children. And in that way, my Zadie lives forever. May he be a Meilitz Yosher for us. May you Zadie be a Meilitz Yosher for us to take care of us and protect us. And as you would close by saying, we should all be Zoha to greet the Mashiach Bim Hera be Amenu Amen. And just for all time's sake, 
He who granted victory to kings and dominion to princes, his kingdom is a kingdom of all ages. He who delivered his servant David from the evil sword, he who opened the road through the sea, a path amid the mighty waters, may he bless and protect, help and exalt the president, the vice president, and all the officers of this country. May the Supreme King of Kings in his mercy inspire them and all their counselors and aides to deal kindly with us and with all Israel. In their days and in our days, Judy shall be saved. Israel shall dwell in security. A Redeemer shall come to Zion. May this be his will. Let us say, Amen. Now we'd like to call upon <coughs> Rabbi Yaakov Fried. Thank you for being here. And thank you for sharing with us your special words. Bishus, Maranan, Rashi Yeshivas, Bishus, the family, the Kahal. I'd like to thank, uh, thank the family for giving me this opportunity to speak um, at the Shloshim for Rev. Uh, David Lairfield. This was, um, it's a, um, a, a special honor for me and I uh, just wanted to say it was about a year ago that I got a call from Rabbi Selmar. And Rabbi Selmar asked me if I would be, if I would come with him to Rabbi Lairfield to be a witness for a shlichus, for a get. And I remember I came with Rabbi Selmar and Already Rabbi Lairfeld was already in his room uh, in the house with his attendants. And we walked in and we all received that, that, um, that um, the hello, the greeting of, of Rabbi Lairfeld with his the shine, the face, you could tell already he, um, he was um, already bedridden and um, Rabbi Selmar and Rabbi Lairfeld, they did what they had to do and it was, a, it was a little difficult for Rabbi Lairfeld to say what he had to say in making the shlichus and we were there to witness it. And then that was pretty much it. The whole thing took about 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then, then I left. And when I was talking shortly afterwards, I met Mrs. Jennifer Layerfield, and I told her what happened, and she, she said to me, she said, you know, Rabbi Layerfield would very much greatly appreciate if somebody would come and, and, and you know, talk to him and maybe in learning. And Baruch Hashem, I, I had a... Um, it was, I had an opportunity, Shabbos mornings, I found myself uh, free, or I made myself free, and I would go every Shabbos to Rabbi Lairfield in the same room, and again, when he would see me, his, that smile, he would um, greet me with a good Shabbos, and I would say for a few minutes, I would, uh, some, I would try to, you know, say a Dvar Torah, something nice that I uh, heard or saw over the week, and um, sometimes I was privileged to, uh, to daven with him. It was very hard for him to speak, and I would be, I would be davening for Rabbi Lairfield. More, most, most of the time, the, somebody from the family was there. It was nice throughout the whole time. Just about every Shabbos, there was always one of the uh, families from far, from close. Somebody was always, uh, always there visiting from the uh, children, from the grandchildren. And um, that's how I, this past year, that's how I, I felt I gained, I was, uh, got a lot closer to Rabbi Lairfield than before. The, um, I'd like to share with you a thought that I heard from my Rosh Hashiva, Rav Hanach Leibowitz. It's a, um, in Vayelach, and in the beginning of Vayelach, Moshe's talking to Klal Yisrael, 
and he says to Klal Yisrael, Vayomer Aleim, he says to them, Ben, Mea Viesim Shana Anochi Hayom. Today I'm 120 years old. La Uchal Od Latseis Vlavo. And I'm not able to go. I'm not able to go out and to come. Hashem Amar Elai, and Hashem said to me, Lo Savor Se Yarden Azeh. You should, you're not going to pass over the Yarden. So Rashi brings two pshatim. What does Latseis Vlavo mean? Rashi first says, he says, you think Yachol Tzatashesh Kocho, you think my, my strength was weak? And he says, no, just I don't have permission to go. And then he says, Davar Acher. And I'd like to focus on this. My Rashiva focused on this. He says, Davar Acher, let's say, Svalavo B'divrei Torah. That I'm not able to go, come and go in Torah. Let's say, Svalavo is to learn Torah. Malamed, Rashi says, that Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, I, I can't go anymore because Hashem took away from me the wellsprings of Chachma. And the Sifsei Chachamim, he quoted the Sifsei, brought down the Sifsei Chachamim on this, Sifsei Chachamim Beis. And the Sifsei Chachamim says, why did Hashem do this to Moshe? V'hatam, k'day shalo yitzta'er, that Moshe should not feel bad, shenitla hagadula mimeno, that the greatness was taken from him, v'nasna li Yeshua, and was given to Yeshua. So Hashem did Moshe chesed. Moshe would, you know, you know, would feel bad that he can no longer lead Klai Yisrael. So Hashem took away his chachma, took away his chachma. He wouldn't feel bad. Look, I can't lead Klai Yisrael. And Yeshua could do it. So I remember my Rebbe asked the question, and his question was, is, yeah, but wouldn't Moshe feel bad that he can't learn Torah? So, you know, he, he, you know he, there is something that he can't do. It's, he's painful that he can't learn Torah. And I remember uh, the, the Rashiva's answer on this, and he said, true, that he would feel bad that he can't learn Torah. But what was more important to Moshe Rabbeinu was that he was able to serve Kalal Yisrael. So if Hashem had to give him a pain of, of, of something, he gave him the lesser of two, of taking away his chachma that he couldn't learn Torah, so he shouldn't feel bad about not serving Kalal Yisrael. So I want to say, talk about uh, Rev Leierfeld. We know, we know he was... Um, we know he's a tremendous Talmud Chacham. In the many years that I was here, I had countless opportunities to hear from him in Shirim. And in particular, I want to just, something that really was, was, I felt was truly amazing. Anybody that had the opportunity to daven here, I've been in the community over 20 years, and when I first came down to North Miami Beach, there weren't too many, um, uh, uh, too many choices of where to daven Mincha Ma'arif. So I was, I often found myself davening Mincha Ma'arif here in the Young Israel. And in between Mincha Ma'arif, Rabbi Lairfield would speak. He'd speak about 10 minutes. Um, he not often would speak on the Parsha, sometimes on other things. And what he spoke in those 10 minutes was really amazing. It was pearl after pearl after pearl. Just one beautiful thought after another. He would open up the Chumash, open up the Parsha, and he would read the, read the Parsha, and he would give such a, a question and such a simple answer. Everybody could understand. And it was the ideas and thoughts that really spoke to everybody, everybody in the, in the room. I, I, I felt the same way also, it, very, very special. He had a very, very strong um, tfisa on Tanakh, especially um, Megillos. He always, if I remember, I guess always, but most of the time, Yom and Tovim, one of the afternoons, one of the speeches in the afternoons or evenings was always dedicated to one of the Megillos, whether it was Kehelas, um, Shira Shirim. 
And the thoughts, the psukim that he chose, and the thoughts that he brought out were just just really amazing. You see a tefisa on uh, a broad spectrum of, 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 of many areas. But that's, again, that was his learning. He constantly was giving shiurim, but that was his learning. But I really felt that Rabbi Lairfield was so, what really, really was, was made him, what was so special to him and was added to all of us was his commitment to the Klau, to the commitment to everybody, Klau Yisrael, I would, in North Miami Beach in particular, everything, everything in this community was all built on the foundation of what Rev, Rabbi Leierfeld started and what he did. I just thought of a few um, things that I remember, again, growing, being in this community for these past years. As a seventh grade Rebbe, you, it's the year of the Bar Mitzvah. And many, many of the boys were part of the shul, and they were bar mitzvah here in this shul. And I remember, I guess, I remember after Myrev, what would happen is, is the bar mitzvah boy would be standing where I am now, and Rabbi Leirfield would be st sitting all the way in the back. And he would, every boy, this is every bar mitzvah boy that was bar mitzvah in this shul had to do this. Sometime the week before his bar mitzvah, maybe once, twice, maybe three times. And Rabbi Leifel would standing in the back and he'd say, start speaking. And every boy, he would, he would, he, you'd hear them knock like, and you had to say, uh, good Shabbos everybody. And then the bangs and he would, teach the boys, it was an amazing thing, how to speak in public. And this, every bar mitzvah boy had this. Spent time with every bar mitzvah boy. I also remember sometimes he'd have the boy lane for him to make sure that, uh, to double check, to help him out with the laning as well. That's one thing, just something that he did for his, for, for everybody that was bar mitzvah here. Also, when I was davening here, often, often, Rabbi Lairfield would tell myself and a few other people if we could remain after Meirev. And I guess I, there was always different things going on. Sometimes there was a wedding going on. He was marrying people in the next room, and he needed a minion. He would like. He wanted a minion for a, for a wedding. Sometimes it had to do with a a ger or gioris. Um, there was always different things going on. And this is what Rabbi Lairfield was, again, involved with the community, whether it was uh, Gittin, whether it was Kedushin. I also remember, not lately, of course, but I remember you would go to any Shalom Zachar on a Friday night, and at some point Rabbi Lairfield would show up with a, with a beautiful Dvar Torah as well. We were also very impressed I mean, it's for, uh, uh, for Rabbi Leifel's Shabbos table. Every new, every person that moved into the community, every new person was always uh, invited by the rabbi and the uh, Rebetzin as well. Together they were a tremendous Balei Hachnasas Archim. And everybody got invited over. And you would think maybe they're the only ones invited over. And their, Baruch Hashem, their houses, any Shabbos was uh, scores of people, plenty, plenty of people at every, at all the meals. I remember, of course, we were invited over then as well, and uh, we had also, we were invited over for Shavar Brachas on Shabbos. And one thing that really stood out was they would have Shavar Brachas for 30, 40 people on dishes. Like, that was like, dishes like you know not just and that was that that's but that's what that's what they did for everybody every, all the people every, in the community people were that that's who he was he was here to serve the community he was here to help everybody base yakov base yakov for many years he was the uh he, he, i think he, i think it was the 12th grade he would teach them parsha um um, he loved the uh, the mostos in the community. Beis Yaakov, 
I remember also once or twice from right here where I am now, his support, public support for Taurus Emes, again for uh, Taurus Emes, Taurus Chaim in the community, anything that was part of his community was, uh, was, was given his full support. The shul, everything, all aspects of the shul. And that's, that's, that's um, again, that's who Reb Leierfeld was. That was his, that was his, that was what, what drove him. That was his um, essence. I had the occasion to be at a Pesach Seder, one Pesach, in the middle. And I was just like, again, it wasn't just the family. Uh, the family, a lot of the family was there, but it was just the, the amount of guests. And just, that's, his, his house was Purim, all the time, people coming and going in his house, and that was the, um, and that's and that's who he was. And again, I felt as much as he was his learning, his Talmud, as 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 as, as a rabbi, as a rav, as a, as a as a teacher, that was he was par excellence. But even more than that was his commitment to the klal, his commitment to klal Yisrael, to the community. And and to everybody, the, the the entire everybody on a personal level and and in, and, and as a clown. And um, this everything, er, all the everything that goes on in the community, Baruch Hashem, the community is flourishing. More shuls, uh, we have uh, um, kolels, yeshivas, and this should be all a, a schus for Rav Leirfield. It should be a schus for the entire family. Um, he's a Rav Baruch. Thank you very much, Rabbi Fried, for those beautiful memories and for your kind words. Birshus of the Chashav Rabbanim that are here with us tonight. Birshus, Rabbits in Lerafield, the entire Lerafield family, and Kala Kadosh Hazeh. All afternoon long, while I was thinking about tonight, a lyric from a song from Avram Fried, going back a number of years, kept on coming back into my mind and hasn't left. And that lyric goes, though we're small, we're standing tall like soldiers, riding high because we're on our Father's shoulders. And I want to share with you a couple of ideas of why that lyric has been stuck in my mind most of this day. Minute from after Pesach and throughout the summer, we learn Pirkei Avos every week. Perek Rishon, the second Mishnah. Shimon HaTzadik Omer, Shimon HaTzadik says, Al Shleisha Dvarim HaElam Omed, on three things the world stands, Al Atayr, Al Avaydev, Al Gmilus Chasodim. Later in the very same Perek, the very last Mishnah, we have Raman Shimon Gamliel Omer. Al Shleisha Dvarim Ha'elam Kayam, on three things the world stands. Al Hadin, Vala Emes, Vala Shalom. And right away the Mepharshim deal with the following issue. Are these two Mishnahs complementing each other? Or are they arguing with each other? Is Shimon HaTzadik the three things that he says? Does that have anything to do with later with Rab Shimon Gamliel has to say? Or are they completely separate? And there's two basic approaches. One approach is to say that they are different. After all, the different words, 
And the Mishnah has explained that the first one is talking about on the following three things the world stands, meaning that this is what the world came into creation. And that would be the first Mishnah. And the one at the end of the Perak, where it talks about that's a reference to once it's created, how does it remain established? How does it keep on going? And it's talking about three different things. So that's one approach. Another approach that we find is that they're complementary. They're not arguing at all with each other. But they're really saying the exact same thing. And that Torah lines up very nicely with Emes. And Shalom lines up very nicely with Gemilus Chasadim. And Din lines up very nicely with Avoda. And so there's no machlokus whatsoever. But if that's the case, this approach begs the following question. If Shimon HaTzadik and Rabbi Shimon Gamaliel are saying the exact same thing, so why don't they use the exact same words? Why do we find that Rabbi Shimon ben Gamaliel, when he's establishing the exact same concept, chooses to use and phrase it in a different way? And so my uncle, Rabbi Moshe Stern, rabbi in Toronto for many, many years, retired to Eretz Yisrael. So he shared with me the following idea. And he explained that they are saying the exact same thing. However, there's one difference between Shimon HaTzadik and between Reb Shimon Gamliel. And what is that difference? That difference is the generation. Shimon HaTzadik lived. Mishyare Anchek Rasa Agdola. He was at the end of one period. And Reb Shimon Gamliel is hundreds of years later, at a different period, speaking at a different time to different people. And so while they have the same message, Reb Shimon Gamliel understood that in this generation, if I want to be able to hand over and to connect with people and to say things in a way that they are going to be able to appreciate and ultimately come closer to the Torah, I have to understand and learn how to communicate and relate to them. And so therefore they are saying the same thing, but they understood this idea that you have to know how to package it and you have to know how to relay it to the generation that you're in. And that's what we're seeing in the first parak of Pirkei Avos. That even though we begin with the Anshei Knesset Zagadola and it ends with Reb Shimon Gamaliel, a span of many, many, many years, the same principles that we begin with are the same ones that we end with but we take into consideration who our audience is and how we have to package the message in order to bring them closer to the Torah. You just heard from Rabbi Fried. Rabbi Lerafield had a very long and illustrious career in the rabbinate, over 60 years. Not only does he span multiple generations in a literal sense, but he also had this ability to connect with every single one of those generations. And so you heard about his chachma in terms of giving over the types of divrei Torah that wowed even the seasoned scholar. You heard about the shir he's giving in Beis Yaakov to the mothers of the future. And then you hear about the bar mitzvah boy. And now I want to tell you about the Bas Mitzvah girl. Since I became the interim rabbi here, so one of the things that I have a privilege to do is sometimes people call me with uh, questions, Shiloh's issues. And I can attest personally, I had no idea that the people who would call Rabbi Lerafield quite literally spanned the generations. From people who knew him from years ago to people like myself who met him just a few years ago. And then I got a call. And one call was from a family that their daughter was going to be bar, bas mitzvah. Their son had been bar mitzvah about a year or two earlier. And as you heard, the minig of Rabbi Lerafield was always to sit down with the bar mitzvah boy and apparently not only the bar mitzvah boy, the bar mitzvah girl too, and to talk with them, teach them how to speak. And so I get a call. 
And they asked me, would I be willing to meet with their daughter? And my first initial reaction was, <laughs> what, what, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> when you meet with her, what, what do you want me to do? And they said, just do what Rabbi Lerifield did. Easy task. But what I was the most amazed is, is that the daughter, the little girl, she remembered when her brother had the bar mitzvah. And she remembered how Rabbi Lerifield took an interest. And she wanted that too. An 11 and a half year old girl. She wants attention from the rabbi. She's going to be bas mitzvah. Someone talk to me. Someone say something to me. This was Rabbi Lerifield in terms of fulfillment of these Mishnayas and Pirkei Avos. Someone who knew how to span the generations and how to reach each and every one at their own level. Most of us are very familiar with a famous story that comes from the Gemara and Masach Shabbos. And it's a story about a ger, or a would-be ger, who wants to become a convert. And he goes over to Shammai and he says, please, I want you to convert me our regalachas. And Shammai doesn't mean its words, didn't see the seriousness in this individual, and told him to move on. And the story goes that he then goes to Hillel Hazakain. And Hillel somehow saw something a little bit different. And he said the same thing, teach me and convert me, I'll regalachas. And Hillel's response, as we all know, was, whatever you don't like others doing to you, don't do to them either. This is the whole Torah, the rest is commentary, now go and learn. And so the questions on this Gemara are obvious. First of all, what exactly does this would-be convert want? What exactly is he asking for when he says, convert me, I'll regalachas, while standing on one foot? And what does Hillel understand from his question? And how does he answer the question? How does this answer satisfy this would-be convert that afterwards he's going to go and follow his advice? And so the Satmar Rebbe Zeichar Tzadik Kaddish Levracha says the following amazing idea. He says that this would-be convert was asking a very serious question. His question was, I know that to become a Jew means to lead a meaningful life. And to lead a meaningful life, it means a life of Torah and mitzvahs. And his question is a very simple question. He wants to know, how do I lead this meaningful life and fulfill all the mitzvahs? When it's not possible to do it, I'll regal achas. And what does it mean, I'll regal achas? So we know the word regal, which means the leg or the foot, but also means, like in the context of Sholesh Regalim, the pilgrimage festivals, the time period where we go to celebrate Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot. So regal also means a time. Says the Satman of, you know what it, the question was? He says, I want to be able to complete my mission in this world and fulfill all 116, 113 mitzvahs, I'll regal achas in one lifetime. But how can I possibly do it? Why can't you do it? He says, it's very simple. There are 613 mitzvahs, and it's not possible for one individual to do them all. Why? Because there are some mitzvahs that apply to kahanim. There are some mitzvahs that apply to women. There are some that apply to men. There are some that apply to people who live in Eretz Yisrael. There are some that apply when there was a Beis HaMikdash. There are some that apply specifically to farmers. How can one person do all of the mitzvahs? It's not possible. They can't. So if they can't do it, what does that mean? They can't do it on regal achas. They can't do it in one lifetime. They're going to have to come back perhaps as a Gilgal and maybe become a Kohen in a different lifetime and something else in a different lifetime. How could it be done in one lifetime? This was the question that the would-be convert was asking. And so what does Hillel answer him? He answers him very simply. He says, you're making one small mistake. You're under the assumption that every individual is mechoyev to do all 613. He says, but that's not true. 
613, that's on Klal Yisrael. The Jewish people as a whole, Knesset Yisrael as a whole, are responsible for 613 mitzvot. And therefore, those who are in Eretz Yisrael are fulfilling those. And those who are farmers are fulfilling those. And those who live during the times of the Beis HaMikdash are fulfilling those. As long as you plug yourself into Knesset Yisrael, into the Klal, and you become a part of them, and you're united with them, then you get all the schus, you get all the merit of all of them. And together you fulfill the 613 mitzvahs. And how do you do that? Well, very simple. You have to plug yourself into the community. And how do you plug yourself into the community? At its root, you start with a basic that don't do to others what you don't want done to yourself. And you continue to build on joining and becoming a part of the community from there. And if you succeed in that, if you succeed in becoming a part of Knesset Yisrael, then without a doubt you've done the 613 mitzvahs as part of the Klal, and you'll be able to accomplish your mission in this world, al regel achas, in one lifetime. Again, as was already mentioned, there is no part of this community, I'm told, that doesn't have the hand of Rabbi Lerafield on it in one way or another. When I moved here a few years ago, so that first Pesach, of course, we all know that you sell your chametz. And so I went over to someone, I said, um, you know, where do you sell your chametz? Where should I sell my chametz? Whom should I sell it? And the response I was given is, doesn't really make a difference. I said, what do you mean? It doesn't make a difference? He says, no, it makes no difference at all. I said, why? He says, because no matter who you're selling it to, at the end, they're all going to be sitting together with Rabbi Lerfield. So it doesn't make a difference. I was at a shiva house a couple of weeks ago. And this woman, her husband, they had, a month or so earlier, had made a chasana for their child. And they told me that one of the things that sort of threw them through a loop was when, was, was when the machatonim asked them, so where are you going to make Shabbat Shabbat brachas? And she started thinking to herself, Shabbat Shabbos brachas, Shabbat Shabbos brachas. What am I going to do? Shabbat Shabbos brachas. And she started thinking back, well, this is not the first wedding I've made. What do I do in the past? And then she instantly remembered and realized, I never made Shabbat Shabbos brachas before. And I said, why? And she said, because Rabbi and Rabbits and Lerifield, they always made the Shabbat Shabbos brachas. They always made the Shabbos Shabbos. Friends, we don't even realize the loss that this community has suffered. And slowly but surely, I start to feel it more and more. As you hear the stories, you hear the greatness, and I ask myself one question. How will it ever be replaced? And on one level, it never can be. But one of the things that Rabbi Lerafield has left us as a legacy is that it's not supposed to be replaced. It's supposed to be built on. And so now, we as a kahila, we as a community, have the opportunity to be able to build on that legacy that has been passed down to us. When I moved here, I was given the opportunity to daven Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur at the Amud. I had been living here 
two months, not a very long time. And the opportunity was offered to me. And someone said to me that you're here for two months and they're asking you to serve as the chazan yom naraim. You know, usually you take a couple of years to get to know a person before you even think about it. The average person would probably take a few years to get to know someone. Rabbi Lerifield was not the average person. And for myself personally, the Akaras Atov that I have for how he transitioned and helped smoothen the move of a large family to a new community with so many unknowns and to welcome us the way that he and his Rebbitzin did. Though we're small, we're standing tall like soldiers, riding high because we're on our Father's soul shoulders. Yehi Zichro Baruch. Now I would like to call upon another Marada Asra of our community, the Rav, of Congregation Shari Tfila, Rabbi Ephraim Shapiro, to give us some Dibre Braha. I hope that Be'ezus Hashem, these words tonight accomplish two things. First and foremost, that they should be lezecher nishmas, uleiloi nishmas, the neshama tahira of Harav David ben Harav Yehuda Leib. That Be'ezus Hashem, these words will allow his neshama tahira to have a lichtig, a lichtig, ganeden. And the second thing that I hope these words accomplish is that it makes all of the men, women, and everyone who's gathered tonight for the Shloishim, it turns us into better people. Be'ezrus Hashem. Those are the two goals that I hope these words accomplish. There's a story that my father, Zatzal, who was a Yedid Neman and a Yedid Nefesh with Rab Harav Lerfield Zatzal, that he said over very often, and I think that this was Rabbi Lerfield's entire life, my father, Zatzal, used to say over a story, uh, many, on many occasions, the Ponevizhirov used to come to South Florida. And on one occasion, when he was leaving, so there was a person from the Miami Beach community that realized after he brought the Ponevizhirov onto the plane in the 60s, you were able to do that, that he didn't give the Ponevizhirov any shliach mitzvah, which is a pretty customary thing to do. So he ran back on the plane. His first name was Leo or Leib. And he took out a few dollars and he put it into the Ponevizhirov's hand. And the Ponevizhirov took the few dollars and pushed it back into the hands of this Yid, Leo, Hebrew name Leib. And he said these words. He says, Reb Leib, you should know, as mein ganze Leben is ein lange shliach mitzvah, meaning to say he didn't need the money per se for a shlichus of a mitzvah, because my gansaleben, my whole existence is one long shliach mitzvah, and I heard my father's atzal say that story, 
countless times. And when Harav Moshe asked me if I, or if I could speak, and I was so appreciative that you gave me this opportunity, I thought that those, that story might be the best possible way to describe the many, many decades that HaKadosh Baruch Hu allowed Rabbi Lairfield in his sojourn on this world to impact people. His Gansa Lebin was one long shliach mitzvah. Everything that he did, he was mekade shem shemayim berabim. And so with that story in my mind that that is mamish the paradigm of who Rabbi Lairfield was, his Gansa Lebin was one long shliach mitzvah. Unquestionably, that was his life. And like a laser beam, he never lost focus. Whether things were easy or not as easy, very few people in this world have the ability, like a laser beam, to stay so focused on their Avedas Hashem. Ruba de Ruba people don't have that ability. Harav Lerfield Zatzal was mamish the epitome of staying focused like a laser beam, ein langa shliach mitzvah. So that got me thinking, if that's what he accomplished, then the next piece of the puzzle on the equation is, how did he do it? So I think I came up with the answer. There's a Gemara in Kedushin where the Gemara says that a person can be Makadish himself to a woman, which loosely translated means he can get engaged or engage himself to a woman, Arison, one of two ways. I don't mean the three ways in the beginning of the Mishnah. I meant to say two people, himself, or he could do it through a shliach. Ha'ish mekadesh boy ubeshluchai. Is there a way that's preferable? So the Gemara says, Omer Reb Yosef, mitzvah boy yoser mi bishluchai. It's better that you should be Makadish yourself and do Arison than send a Shliach for multiple reasons. But that was an exact quote of the, Mish- of the Mishnah and the subsequent Gemara. Ha'ish Makadish boyu b'shluchay om rabbi yaisa mitzvah boyu yaisa mi So I once heard one of the most elegant pshatim. It's hard to even describe how beautiful the pshat is. Notice that when the Mishnah talks about this man, it says ha'ish. And any time you have a hey, a hey is a hey hayadi. It means the quintessential man, not like an average person, not like even an exceptional person. Ha'ish, the quintessential capital neon letters person. So the Gemara is asking homiletically, ha'ish mekadesh, a man could bring kedusha and sanctify himself in this world in one of two ways. Boy ubishluchai. His shlichim, his messenger, means his erudition, his knowledge, his lectures, his drasha, his shiurim. He's a great teacher. But the other way is boy. Boy means his ibergegeben kite and his prezenlach kite. He's the real deal. He walks the walk, talks the talk. His whole persona is just real. So the Mishnah is asking, when a man, the quintessential man, wants to bring Kedusha into this world, how is he going to be more effective? Boy, ubishluchai. With his lectures, his drushas, his shiurim, and his classes, or boy, with who he is. Omar Reb Yaisef, mitzvah boy, yaiser mi bishluchai. If you really want to be that quintessential person, who has the ability to really impact the core of people, Rabbi Yosef is telling us there are two great ways, but at the end of the day, mitzvah boy yoser mi b'shluchai. As effective as the classes and the drosh and the lectures and the shiurim are, but a person being the real deal is everlasting. It's something that people will never, ever forget, perhaps even beyond when a person may not remember the lecture that was given. And so that, I think, is the answer to the question that I asked a few moments ago. 
How did Harav Lerfield Zatzal successfully have a whole life of ein langa shliach mitzvah, like laser beam focus, always bringing a Kiddush Hashem to this world? The answer is mitzvah boy yaiser mi b'shluchai. Nobody uh, needed me to remind them about the drushas, the shiurim, how he was the paradigm and the quintessence of a teacher, of a rebbe, of a rav, a brilliant ga'in, a brilliant tamal chacham, who am I to even say that? All of that is impeccably true. But mitzvah boy, when you saw Rabbi Lairfield, it reminded me, somebody once said that every time a Jew walks out of his home in the morning, he should tell himself, today may be the only time that somebody who's watching you sees what a Torah Yid should look like. So you should make it count. Any time you saw Rabbi Lairfield, you knew exactly what a Torah Yid was supposed to look like in the way he dressed, in the way he presented himself, in his whole persona, his entire being, his entire existence, you could have seen him on any occasion. And had that been just your one time that you looked, learned, or glanced at Rabbi Lairfield, you could have said, that's what God wants a Torah Jew to look like. Mitzvah bo yaisir mi b'shluchai. As impressive as the ge'oinus, the Talmud Chacham, a tremendous, tremendous erudition was, but the boy, the presenlochite, and his whole demeanor, that's something that uh, surely impacted generations and will continue to impact generations because that's never, ever forgotten. There's an unusual Gemara where the Gemara tells us that Rav Broca was once in the marketplace and he met Elio Anovi and he said, anybody here a Ben Olam Haba? B'nai Olam Haba? And Elio said no. A little while later, Elio Anovi said to Rav Broca, when two people came into the market, those are the only two here that are B'nai Olam Haba. Naturally, Rav Broca ran over to those two about whom Elio Anavi said they are the only two B'nai Olam Haba, and he asked the two, what is it that you do that you merited this appellation of being the only B'nai Olam Haba in the vicinity? And they simply answered, we cheer up people, we're batchanim, we cheer up people when they're depressed. Rashi says four words, Semechim umesamchim b'nei adam. I guess that literally means we're happy and we make other people happy. In the time that I have left, I want to tell you three things on Rashi that I think Lanias Daiti are the most apropos description of Harav Lerfield Zatzal. Number one, why did Rashi say the words B'nai Adam? All Rashi needed to say was Semechem Umesamchem. We're happy and we make others happy. What in the world is the addition of B'nai Adam teaching us? Those two words seem to be superfluous. So I saw Rev. Melech Biederman say in his inimitable style, Rashi means, you know why they were B'nai Olam Haba? Semechem umesamchem, we're happy and we make other people happy. B'nai Adam, by making people feel like they're B'nai Adam. We restore people's self-esteem so that they feel like B'nai Adam because when people feel that they have no self-worth and when people are going through a tzara and when people are a bit depressed, they don't even feel like a human. They don't feel that anybody's giving them the time of day. The success of these two when they made others happy is B'nai Adam. They made people feel like B'nai Adam. You make me feel like a million bucks. You make me feel like it's worth getting out of bed in the morning. You restore my self-esteem that I'm a Ben Adam. 
And that's why they ultimately became B'nai Olam Haba, because they made everyone feel like a Ben Adam, like a human being. That is for sure. The life and legacy of Rav, Rav Lerfield Zatzal. He never, ever had a bad word to say about anybody. Just ask yourself honestly about all, I don't know, everybody should ask themselves, could the sentence I just said, would it be true about us? Ask. Rabbi Lerfield Zatzal never, ever had a bad word to say about anybody. And not only that, but to accentuate the positive, he was so exceedingly generous with his compliments. He always had the kindest things to say to everybody. It was from this very stender that on countless occasions, when he cared so much about the Tzibor and the Kehillah that gatherings would be called, and different Rabbanim and speakers would be asked to be called up, and he would introduce them. And I always remember he first began with the vart that Hashem likes it when a person is makatzer and speaks short, based on the Pesach and Rus, Vayoymer Hashem, I think, Vayoymer Lakaitzim Hashem Imochem, that was like a vart. There are a lot of things that I always quote Rabbi Lerfield Zatzal. That's one of them. But whenever he introduced the people, to be honest, you didn't want the introduction to stop. He made everybody feel like B'nai Adam. No matter who you were, he was extremely gracious with his compliments. And he just made you feel like a great human. It's an art and a talent that very, very few people do as successfully as Harav Lerfield Zatzal. The second thing I think the words B'nai Adam are teaching us is sometimes people cheer up and are kind to those from their own milieu or our grandparents were together in a particular shtetl or I happen to dive in the same havara as you so I like you. I think Rashi is telling us the greatness of those two was Semechim umesamchim b'nei Adam they were kind to everyone. They didn't reserve their kindness for the rich, the famous, the elite, the choshev. It didn't make a difference who you were. These two were just kind to absolutely everybody. And that, I think, is something that I and a whole kahil of many generations were impacted by Harav Lerfield Zatzal. That his making us feel like a Ben Adam, it didn't make a difference who you were. It was mentioned twice already about the selling of the Chomets for over 20 years. I and others for much longer than that had the privilege to sit in the room behind the Heichel when he would do the Mechiras Chomets with the non-Jew. There's no better way to describe that experience, and that's exactly what it was. It was an experience than to tell you. If you were in that room, you don't need any explanation of what it was like. And if you weren't in that room, there isn't anything I could ever say that would properly give over what it was to experience Rabbi Lairfield doing Mechiras Chametz with the non-Jew. Where do I begin the way he explained it, the way he made the non-Jew feel so comfortable, the way you could clearly see his incredible, incredible bikiyas in the subject? As the years grew, more and more Rabbanim came, and then you saw the Rabbanim bring their children and their grandchildren, and like some other family members as well, who didn't want to witness the experience of Mechiras Chomets of Rabbi Lerfield to the non-Jew? And never forget, more Rabbanim came, and then Rosh Koilal and Rosh Shivas. Never did it end without Rabbi Lerfield being the most humble human being and saying, is there anything you'd like to do differently than I did? 
Is there anything you want to add? Would you like me to do something differently? Is there... Who, who does that? You came to me. This is the way we do... Not Rabbi Lairfield. We're in this together. So is there a way you'd rather me say it? Is there another Kenyan you'd rather me make? Is there something you'd like me to do a bit differently? The tremendous anivus, the exuberance, it was mamish in experience. I, the last many years, brought our children, our sons, to watch it. That was something to see. The way the ultimate Rav conducts Mechiras Chametz, B'nai Adam, he treated everybody with extraordinary respect. And before moving on to the third and final component, which I think is the most important, I want to say on a personal note, the debt of Hakara Satov. I think everybody knows that my family, my parents, and the Lairfields were and are, my mother and Rebbe Tzin Lairfield, they should both live and be well, extremely, extremely close. From the deepest and closest and most passionate friendships. I myself, as I mentioned when I went to be Menachem Oval, a decent part of when I grew up, I spent first in the home in South Beach, or mostly there, if my parents were away by an Aguda convention or on their many trips to Russia, that was exactly the uh, Chaim Yitzchak Eliyahu was one of my dearest friends. That's exactly where I stayed, and Rabbi and Rebbe Tzinlerfi, Lebada ben Chaim Lechaim, always made me feel like a, another one of their sons. So my debt of Hakara Satayv, I could never adequately express, but at least I could publicly thank Rebbitz and Lairfield for everything uh, that was so very meaningful to me. But the one thing that I want to single out was when I took the position and I moved to North Miami Beach a bit more than 23 years ago, I cannot describe to you how kind and gracious Rabbi Lairfield Zatzal was to me. He called me into his office here in the shul, and my father, Zatzal, wasn't alive at that point. I know Rabbi Yaakov has said on many occasions of having had the ability to be able to turn to his father for the erudition and the advice and asking Shilas, Rabbi Lairfield Zatzal understood that I didn't have that privilege. And so in the most elegant and calm way, he taught me so much. He called me into his office. One of the first things he did was he pointed to a large set of svarim from Rabbi Elio Kitov, and he said, buy this on Chumash because this is a great staple and it will give you tons of... He was telling me how to come up with good drushas and where I could find Divrei Torah. He had no problem sharing from all of his wisdom and his advice to someone much, much younger than him in the same community, because what difference does it make? If it's your life is one long shliach mitzvah and it's riboy koi shemayim, does it make a difference? I remember him telling me as clear as today after he told me to get that set of sarm, which I did buy in Torah Treasures on Miami Beach, he gave me a lot of, that's because I was living there then, I don't mean one store over another. That's where I was before I moved up here. He gave me extraordinary advice. I remember him telling me sometimes you'll get very overwhelmed with the fact that Mishulachim may come at the most inopportune time and it may really throw your day off and aggravate you. So... Rabbi Lairfield said, always ask yourself, which side of the desk would you rather be on? The one where you're giving or the one where you have to take? All of these nuggets. He knew I was lost. He knew how young I was. He knew that I didn't have the ability to turn to my father's atzal. He knew that. And so all of the advice and all of the nuggets and all of the care and all of the fatherly feeling, he just made me feel like that Ben Adam. I hope those words that I said the last few minutes were at least in the smallest way my chance of saying thank you to Rebetz and Lairfield and to the entire family and expressing Akara Satoiv. And the third and final thing I'd like to say to conclude 
which maybe sums everything up the best. You're right, what we said was he was the ultimate shliach mitzvah. His whole life was a kiddush Hashem. As great as his erudition was, his persona wanted to make you better. He's what a Torah Jew should look like. He made everyone feel like a Ben Adam. Didn't make a difference who you were. But all of that is only for one reason. So I saved it for last. Why in the world did Rashi say that these two are B'nai O'ilam Haba, Semechem Umesamchem, they're happy and they make others happy? Who cares if they're happy? The point is, they make others happy. What difference does it make if they're happy? I think Rashi is teaching us the only way that you could successfully make others happy is you have to be happy. You have to be a truly happy person. You mamish, mamish have to be besimcha. Because if you're not truly someone who's besimcha, you can't adequately make others happy. The greatness in those two was, you know why they were misameach others? Because Samechim, they were happy people. They were genuinely, genuinely happy people. And if you're a happy person, then it's contagious and infectious and you could successfully make other people happy. Rabbi Lairfield Zatzal, Harav David, Ben Harav Yehuda Leib, was one of the happiest people on the planet. Always besimcha. Always besimcha. When I went to be Menachem Oval, I commented to the boys, to the sons, I should say, that growing up in the home, I used to wonder when I came back, I said to my parents, like, if you look on the side, I say this in the most honorable way, if you look on the side of Rabbi Lairfield's eyes, there were creases like perpetual creases. I told my parents, he's always smiling. This was 40-something years ago. I remember here the creases because he never, ever stopped smiling. Subsequently, some of the sons told me that I think you said Rabbi Lairfield's father-in-law said the same thing. I think that's who you had quoted. Harav Eichenstein made the same comment. But I was a little boy, and I came home and I told my parents, he's always happy, he's always smiling. I could see because he has creases on the side of his eyes, etched and ingrained because he's somebody who's always besimcha. And that, to me, is the answer to everything. All that he accomplished is because simechim, he was a happy, happy yid. And nowhere was his happiness more evident than in his, to me, than in his home library, when he, his office, I meant, where he was surrounded by his svarim. I don't know how many dozens of times I was in that office, but however many countless times it was, he would have the svarim open, he would have a pen out, and he would mamish, like tear through the svarim and write down, like that's the way he felt svarim should look and should be learnt, that you can mamish tell that they were gone through clearly. I feel that that room was the epicenter of his simcha and his happiness surrounded by his svarim. And that to me is something that I hope we could all carry on that legacy. Semechim umesamchem b'nei adam. Make everyone feel that's what a Torah is because Rabbi Lairfield Zatzal was always besimcha. I want to just give the entire family a bracha. Rabbi Zin Lairfield shall live and be well and Harav Moshe and Harav Yaakov and Harav Aaron and Harav Binyamin and Harav Chaim Yitzchak Eliyahu and all of their family shall live and be well. And I just want to give a bracha that it says these two merited being B'nai Olam Haba. I guess measure for measure because they made people feel like B'nai Adam, they were B'nai Olam Haba. Mida Keneged Mida. And so I hope that's the bracha for Rabbi Lairfield because doesn't everybody have a chalik in Olam Haba, Kol Yisrael? The answer is everybody has a chalik, but it takes a while to get there. There's punishment, there's chibut hakever, there's a lot of purification that's needed. It says the Sefer Torah's Chaim, somebody who's happy and makes other happy, he's a ben oilam haba. 
No purification is needed. No punishment is needed. No delay is needed. That person and only that person goes straight to Olam Haba. Be'ezer Sashem may the neshama tahira of Harav David ben Harav Yehuda Leib indeed be a ben Olam Haba, straight to Gan Eden, straight to Olam Haba, and he should ask the Rebbeinu Shalaylam to answer all of our tefillahs. Yashikoach, and thank you very much, Rabbi Shapiro, for those beautiful words. And now we call upon the Marada Asra of the Young Israel, Staten Island, son of Rabbi Lerfield, that's all, Rabbi Yaakov Lerfield. I would like to thank everybody for coming. Even though I physically am standing and speaking, I'm speaking on behalf of our mother and my brothers and our sisters-in-law. Our father was a most remarkable man. He was a Rav for, quote, for close to 65 years. I've asked him many times when he wanted to retire, and he always says, I'm never going to retire. He loved the Rabbanus. He, he actually enjoyed it. He loved speaking. He loved teaching. There's something called the art of homiletics. My father was a master of homiletics. He was articulate and he was eloquent. When it came to Gittin or Evan Ezer, there were very few in the world that knew it as he knew it. Garris conversions again. He was one of the experts in the world. He enjoyed helping people, advising people, counseling people, and together with my mother, may she live and be long for many, many, many years, they hosted, I don't know how many thousands of people, for Shabbos, for Yantif, for Sheva Brachas, together. Our father and our mother built, which what I would call, which is very rare in America, something that is known as a base harav, the home, the place where the rabbi and the rabbi live. It becomes a landmark. And that is what they built in North Miami Beach. His father and his father-in-law trained him and taught him the fine art and mastery of becoming a Rav. But our father was unique. He wasn't just a quintessential Rav, and he was in all, all of the areas and facets. There must be something more that for 65 years kept him going. During the Shiva, many people came into the house, in Echus and Kamus, which means there was physically many people, and also if you count up their quality, so many different people came in. There were Rabbanim, Rosh Yeshivas, teachers, members of the Kehila, Balabatim, many so-called friends, many confidants. Many people simply came because they felt close to my father, and they owed it to my mother or to us to come and tell us what my father did for them. And after listening to all of them, I came away saying to myself, many of the people that were here, of the hundreds of thousands that came, they held our father in awe. They held him in awe for his learning, for his seicha, which means he had a very logical way of cutting through to a problem and giving the proper advice. Many people that came considered him a real friend or simply someone that they can turn to no matter what was going on in their lives. But many people simply came and they showed us how they felt connected to him. And for the last month, this is Shloshim, I reached out to every, of, every one of my brothers and to my mother. I got calls from many Rabbanim that knew our father and I asked them all. I know that everyone is going to be speak. I want to be able to shots up. I want to be able to understand what made our father so special and unique. Our father was a wonderful father. He gave us critique. He gave us constructive criticism. He knew our faults, and he tried to help and advise us to fix or to somehow change these faults of ours. Our father and our mother 
are not the type of parents that believe their children can do no wrong. Trust me when I tell you that when we were growing up, our father and um, our mother found many things that we did that were wrong. He spoke to us softly but firmly, and when we were wrong and we messed up, he let us know, as my mother still does. <laughs> One method that my father used to let us know that we were wrong and we messed up was he would write us a letter or a note. He would, sp he would quote a Pusuk from Kohelas with a Rashi. He would quote a Pusuk from Mishlei and tell you to look at the parish, the commentary of the Vilna Gon. At one of the family smachot, I don't know if it was an Ofru for a bar mitzvah or sheva brachas of some of us that are living in New York, so my parents always came to all of, the, our, all of their children, their grandchildren's smachot, simchas. In New York, they always came. My mother willingly, and of course, she slept my father. But they came to every simcha. And at one of the times they came, I don't remember which one, my father stayed by us, by me, me and my wife and I in Staten Island, and he spent Shabbos with us. I remember I asked him to speak in shul, and he says, no, I want to hear you. This is your show. I want to hear you. This is your bimah. So I said, Dad, I speak every week. You know, I speak sometimes five, six, seven times on a Shabbos. I've, I've spoken here th tens of thousands of times. I said, Dad, do you want to finally hear someone good? You want to speak? So we made a show. We made a compromise. There's six, seven different speeches. It's a big show. There's different minyanim. I'll speak some, and he'll speak some. So he spoke, and he loved it. He loved it. And the people loved it because my father walks around and he picks up his hands and he yells, whatever my father always does, and he stares at you and he looks and he speaks softly. And then he raises his voice. He's an expert. He's an expert. And the people, when they saw my father do it, they all walked over to me the next day and said, we know where you stole it from. You got it from your father. I said, sure, he's a great teacher. Why not? Steal from the best. So we spent the Shabbos with my wife and I um, I think he enjoyed himself. And three days later, I got a letter in the mail. Most of you would get a letter that said, we want to thank you for hosting us. We had a wonderful Shabbos. The food was delicious. The company was nice. It's Miros. I will read you my father's letter. Libni Ahuvi Yaakov Admeir Ve'esrim Shana. I in Perkei Avos, Perak Bey's Mishnah Dalad, which means you all heard of Perkei Avos. So he says, look at Perkei Avos, chapter 2, Mishnah 4, Hillel Omer, because Mishnah is quite long, so he wants me to focus on one line. The Ayin Shum, the Ferish Yachin Os Lamed Bey's. And look at the commentary. If you open up at home, you have a, a, the old fashioned Mishnah, it's called Yachin of Oaz. There's a parish in the bottom called Yachin. So he told me to open up a Perk Yavos, Perak Beis, Mishnah Dalad, the parish of the Yachin, Oslamid Beis, Vahamevin Yavin. And if you know anything, you'll understand what I'm trying to tell you. Biava Rabba Avicha. With much love, your father. And that was it. I had no idea what he's talking about. So I went at home. I have Bar Hashem Sarm. I opened up. Perk Yavos, Perak Beis, Mishnah Dalad, the Paris of the Yachin, and I read it. My father waited two days for the mail to get to me, and he would call me and say, did you get the letter? I said, not yet. Call me the next day, did you get the letter? And every one of you know that when he wanted something done, he wanted it done yesterday. Finally, I get the letter, and he calls, did you get my letter? I said, yes. He says, did you look it up? We know we don't mess around. Yes, I did. Did you read it? I said, yes. He says, read it to me. <laughs> Daniel, you can hear my father saying this. Mosh, Aaron, Benjamin, you can hear my father, Leib, you can hear my father saying this. So I opened it up, and I began reading, in which, of course, my father said, slower. Kishinis manis lemanhig hatsibor. When you become a leader in a community, mamish, 
even though that means you can no longer, if you're their leader, if you're their rav, you can no longer hang out with them. You don't go to a bar with them. You're not going to a game with them. You can't because you're now the leader. Because once you become their leader, you could never show them that you are on the same playing field and equal to them because you're the leader. Even though you're not supposed to come down and show them that you're going to a bar and you're equal to them, you cannot remove yourself completely. As if you are the master and the boss. That it's somehow beneath you to mix with them. Because if ever you let the people feel that they are beneath you to deal with them, you lose their love. Because they'll look at you as someone who is condescending and somehow above and not part of them. And therefore he writes and says, every wise man should know. Every leader needs to know how to combine and to meld a little bit of hardiness with much humility. And the mix has to be an exact measurement, some of this and some of that. A little haughtiness, a little bit of humbleness. Somehow on top, somehow with the people. Lefi hazman, according to the time. The hamakom, and the place. The adam, and the person you're dealing with. Hu ha'ish hamutzlach. And that individual that can synthesize greatness and humbleness, aloofness, and somehow together with the people, any man that can master doing and melding them together, that is the ish hamutzlach, Ashir Yia Ahuv, he will be beloved, Umechubad, but at the same time respected. After I read it, my father says, You're not done yet. I said, You're right, there's brackets. He says, Read the brackets. Ushmor Ela Hadvarim Hamuatim. And I warn every rabbi to heed these words Kihem Sod Yakar. Because it is a very dear secret. Ashir yikashelu bo rov b'nei adam. And most rabbanim fail. B'midas hen cheser hen yeser. By either too much hardiness or too much humbleness. You have to have the exact proper mixture. For the time, the place, and the individual. And my father said to me, I enjoyed Shabbos immensely. But you're a little bit too friendly. Be well, goodbye, love, dad. That was it. And then he will leave me to stew with this Mishnah and his Musr, which was given softly but firmly, quietly but loudly. Just think carefully what I said. And again, it wasn't just his words. It would be a Rashi and Mishle with the Gra, with the uh, Mishle, Pirkeyavos, and that is how we gave Musr. This Mishnah was written by Hillel, Hillel Hanasi. Hillel Hanasi perhaps was one of the greatest leaders we ever had. He came 100 years before the Chorban Abayas. He gave, had 80 students, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. He was the grandfather of Yehuda Hanasi. He was by far one of the greatest, greatest of all of our leaders. And Hillel, Hillel, this Mishnah is Hillel. He's teaching you how to be a leader. You can't be on the pedestal, but you can't be on the ground. It depends on the person, depends on the time. You have to somehow synthesize and put everything exactly together. Our father, we rode bikes together. We had picnics, we went to the zoos, we had road trips, we went on hikes. He loved nature, he loved history, he loved wrestling with his children and beating the daylights out of his grandchildren. But through everything we did with our father, he was always father with a capital S, which means the yira and the kavod that we had for him, even if we were wrestling on the floor, it was with the most dignity we could have for him. And even those few times that I beat him badly, I did it with honor.
He didn't demand the yira and the kavod. It was the way he carried himself. And therefore, my father taught us as a true parent, you're walking on a very tight rope. It's a very fine line. There are many parents who want to be best friends with their children, and they're on a first-name basis. There are other parents who are so domineering that if you walk into their home with the children, you're walking on eggshells. Each way is wrong. A parent needs to know that on the one hand, I am my child's best friend and a confidant, and there's unconditional love, and there's closeness and warmth and empathy, but at the same time, Father with a capital F. My father walked that line perfectly. Now that I am much older and a grandparent many times over at Baruch Hashem, I'm beginning to realize the greatness of my father as a father. Mom, you're no slouch. As well as daddy did it as a father, you have and you will continue to do it as a mother. As your Rav, he always had a smile, a good word, loved a good joke, happy, friendly, helpful, but always. Clean white shirt that fit properly. Black jacket, black pants, black tie, black hat, all impeccably worn. And it fit just right. He was always prepared, he was meticulous, he was punctual. Someone that they misbehaved in shul, he knew exactly how to deal with that person. He was always in control of the situation. My father, as the Rav, walked that fine line, that tight rope, where you can fall into the precipice either way, depending how you behave, where somehow he was haughty, he was the Rav, he had a position that demanded kavod, but on the other hand, he was the most humble, joking, smiling person you ever met. Try to figure out how you can do such a thing. That was the greatness of my father. My father knew this parish on the, on the Perky of us, and hence he knew exactly how to do his rabbinus. If you think about it, great people, great people are very complex because they straddle two seemingly opposite disparate midos at the exact same time. They know how to blend and meld them into a beautiful tapestry of the way a person is supposed to behave. As it says, La Kolzman, there's a time for everything. For everything. You just have to be that master to know when, where, how, and whom you're talking to. My father was aloof, but he was down to earth. Very demanding, but easily yielding. Very strict, but forgiving. He was serious, but always with a smile. He demanded the covered, but at the same time, he ran away, Barach Mina covered as fast as he could. He was impatient, but he was calming and soothing. He was firm, but he was soft and understanding, all depending on the time, place, and individual that he was talking to. He commanded this bima with an iron fist, but yet he sat there and gave every child Hershey kisses when davening was over. If you think about it, during davening, if someone misbehaved, what he would do to them, but when davening was over, every child came up to shake his hand and get a Hershey's kiss. It's simply unbelievable. My father always told, told us, don't be a legend in your own mind and don't take yourself too serious. serious. Any good parent, any good boss, any good leader, and of course the Rav needs to master how to walk that fine line of somehow being extremely humble, but at the same time being a little bit aloof. Also, of course, depending on the time, place, and individual, but if you could master that, and it's so difficult, and you need to be so precise before you fall, that, as the Yachin tells us, is the Ish and the Rav that is Matzliach, that is Mechubad, he is honored, and also at the same time, Ahuv, beloved by the people. That is our Father, and your Rav. That made him beloved, and that made him honored. Our father, your Rav, mastered this art that Hillel says is the only way a person should lead others. That is what made him great, special, unique, and majestic. Mom, 
we're getting older, you're boys. And to be honest, even though I've thought about, not I, all of us have thought about daddy for years, the way we were all raised by him. And we're speaking now about daddy. And since father passed away, I've been trying to put into words what made daddy so unique. And it was that ability to walk that fine line. And at the same moment, be firm, but yet soft. Somehow be aloof, but down to earth. He was able to do that. And I'll be honest, mom, as well as daddy did it, you do it equally well. You could be soft, you could be motherly, and you could be very demanding. And there's a special art and a special brilliance and a majestic way, and Rev Hirsch calls it the majesty of man, that you, together with daddy, raised your children, raised the community, and are now raising grandchildren and great-grandchildren in Halavai. You should all be together for 120 years the role models that our father and our mother gave to their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and to the whole community. That fine line that we could all learn from as a parent, as a boss, as a leader, as a parent, as everything, is something that is unique and majestic that Baruch Hashem, both my father, our father, and our mother possess, which is what makes them the wonderful, unique, special people that they are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rabbi Lerfield. There are no more precious words than the words of a son towards their father, especially a son who is able to learn from a master like their father and master the art that was given over to them. A Shloshim program is literally um, one long lesson, if you will, one long study in Pirkei Ovos. And literally tonight, um, we've had that opportunity several times to quote and listen and hear from Pirkei Ovos. And so I think it's fitting to end with how we end every study of Pirkei Ovos. We always end Pirkei Ovos, whatever mission we learn, we say the words, Ratzah HaKadosh Baruch Hu Lezakos Es Yisrael. Hashem wanted to give merit to the Jewish people. Lefikach Hirbalahem Torah Mitzvos. And therefore he gave them more Torah and Mitzvos. Sometimes, unfortunately, there are individuals who see mitzvos as a little bit of a burden, a little bit of a difficulty. And it's an unfortunate misunderstanding because as Hanani ben Akash is telling us, why did Hashem give us more and more mitzvos? Because Lezako says B'nai Yisrael. And more than anything else, this is the legacy that Rabbi Lerafield Zatzal has left us with. The understanding, the realization that mitzvah, observance, Torah, the opportunity to connect with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that is a zechus, and his entire life was a living dedication to that idea and to that concept, that it is a blessing and a privilege to have that relationship with Hashem, and it's the ultimate zechus. And may we, as a community and as a shul, build on that legacy, pick up on it, and continue to grow that legacy within this community until we are once again rejoined with our beloved rabbi with the coming of Mashiach, Bimher of Yamenu. Amen. Thank you all once again for being here, and we will now continue and conclude with Marif.